tonight on CFDK TV News, terrorist residents escaping relationship violence will have a place to stay soon. We have some more politician reactions to recent events before the BC election, and Metro Vancouver Handy Dark drivers have officially gone on strike. Northwest BC's only television news team. We are CFTK TV News. Good evening, I'm Cal Baslett, and here's what's making the news in the Northwest and beyond for today. Federal NDP leader Jagmeet Singh said he's ripped up the supply and confidence deal his party had with the minority Liberal government that helped keep them in power. Singh also said he notified Prime Minister Justin Trudeau that the NDP are pulling out of the deal because of the government's inability to tackle corporate greed and its inability to stop the surging opposition conservatives. He said liberals are too weak, too selfish, and too beholden to corporate interests to fight for people, and that his party will deliver relief, fix health care, build homes, and stop price gouging. There is set to be new housing available this October in Terrace for women who are escaping relationship violence in the Northwest. CFDK's Damian Smith now with more. And as the days get shorter come this fall, there will be a new housing opportunity for those who need it. At Ellis Place, there will be 22 units available for women who need accommodation when fleeing relationship violence. With the opening of the building to the public this past Friday, this settlement hits close to home for at least a few of the speakers. Uh, my, when I grew up, my mom and I had to flee uh, violence. And in the city, I grew up in, in Toronto, a great big city. And I found out only years later that the place that we got to was the only shelter that was available in a city that size. And thank God it was there. We're going to tour this amazing building and see how it's changing the lives for people who are fleeing violence. How this is such a, such a progressive, safe space where you, your family, your pets can all come when you need it and how it provides wraparound supports for everything that you need to rebuild your life and restart. Now Ellis Place is just a small example of new housing built around the province where the BC government has provided $19 billion towards housing investment since 2017. But as Amanda Owens puts it, there is a need for these types of homes when unhealthy personal problems arise. When women and children come here after either their stay at the transition house or whoever, whatever means they, that brings them here, um, living in a complex like this brings together a community. So peer supports, you know, you find friendships and relationships and support one another, but also our staff here can provide advocacy and connection to other supports and agencies within the community as well, which is, um, helps provide more stability. Social service agencies like Cassan work with a lot of other agencies in town. There's a lot of collaboration that goes on and this kind of just extends that a little bit further. Um, just all of the organizations and agencies supporting community members together. And it was a collaboration of many parties that made this empty lot into the three-story building it is today. Without, you know, coming together like this with the city support, BC housing support, um, you know, having such a great architect and development consultant and, and the staff team is absolutely amazing that help um, bring this all together. So yeah, lots of thanks for everyone involved. From Terrace, I'm Damien Smith. It's been revealed that the city of Terrace is supporting the Kitsumkillum First Nation as they aim to get control of the three logging tenures tied to the now closed Skeeta sawmills. Well, the First Nation did already buy these sawmills licenses as part of a deal that would see the Kitsumkillum take the properties out of bankruptcy. Actual control of all the Skeeta sawmill assets would have to be granted by the BC provincial government who let the nation negotiate the deal in the first place, and that process could reportedly end up taking about six months. Kitsum Caleb has apparently said that they want to get logging as soon as humanly possible so they can get the funds required for them to put an actual business plan in place. Now over to what some are calling chaos, pawns being moved on a chessboard. BC Conservatives have been scrambling to make their moves to confirm candidates after BC United's sudden election pullout exit, but some aren't happy with their landing spot. It's become a game of musical chairs at the BC Legislature as candidates and MLAs try to win or keep a seat here after October's election. A political party moving their 
contestants and their candidates around like pawns on a chessboard. After BC United leader Kevin Falcon suspended his party's campaign, he and BC Conservative leader John Rustad said the Conservatives would field the best team going forward, one that now includes three more former BC United MLAs, Trevor Holford, Peter Millibar and Ian Payton. When this whole thing imploded a week ago with BC United uh, falling apart, uh, I really didn't have a lot of options. Independent just doesn't cut it for me to get things done for people in Delta South. Rusted was quick to say the Conservatives were not diluting their brand. It doesn't change who we are as the Conservative Party of British Columbia. It is great to have them uh, as part of it. Up to six candidates are expected to be dropped from the BC Conservatives, including Rachel Weber and Prince George. Turfed over the weekend after a string of controversial social media posts about 5G cell towers that became lightning rods for criticism. Whoever wins the battle for the centre, particularly in the big urban areas of the province, will win the election. Meanwhile, BC United MLA Jackie Taggart announced she's not running, and Mike Bernier confirmed he is running as an independent, noting he could have extra influence if it's a minority government and he wins his seat. Especially the BC Conservatives will then be coming to myself and maybe Dan Davies and anybody else that runs as an independent uh, begging for our vote and support. The consolidation of both right-of-centre parties was aimed at avoiding vote splitting. Asked today on a trip to B.C. whether he'd now endorse the loan option on the right, federal Conservative leader Pierre Polyev said this. British Columbians will want a common-sense Conservative government, both provincially and federally. Rusted said he expects to have his team assembled by the end of the week with maybe two spots remaining as politicians across B.C. scramble to find a new seat and a new political landscape. Coming up next, video of a shocking crime was surprisingly captured by the perpetrator. Welcome back. Metro Vancouver Heady Dirt drivers and other staff recently followed through on their threat to begin striking. The two sides scheduled a session with a mediator for Sunday. As CTV's Ben Milger reports, in the meantime, it's the passengers relying on the service who will suffer. It's a service many people rely on as their primary means of transportation. But 600 handy dart workers are now on strike, providing only essential service for critical medical appointments such as cancer treatment. We really just want fair wages. We want comparable wages and close to uh, conventional buses as possible. We feel that it's our time to bridge that gap. As the workers push for higher wages, people like Julio Cristales are caught in the middle. Living with stage four cancer, he relies on handy dart because the disease spread to his spine, paralyzing him from the waist down. I use handy dart quite a bit. It's a great service when, you know, when it works. On Sunday, it took him four hours to get home after a cab driver subcontracted by handy dart drove him to an address in Vancouver instead of his home in Coquitlam and made him get out despite the obvious error. The workers say contracting out to cabs is another reason they're on strike. There's no reason for them to be contracting when we have all of these drivers that are here and willing to work. Transdev, a French multinational, runs Handy Dart for TransLink. Our priority remains to reach a fair contract that balances the needs of our employees, Handy Dart clients, and taxpayers. We apologize to the community for the public impact of this collective bargaining dispute, the company said in a statement. The two sides have agreed to meet with a mediator on Sunday. It's absolutely vital that the drivers and the company are at the table to hammer out a deal on this thing. For now, Cristales can still go to cancer appointments, but he can't get to his son's football games. It's good for my mental health to be able to get out, see my sons play. Like It means a lot to me and it will affect me. That's why he's hoping for a swift resolution. Ben Milger, CTV News, Vancouver. A quiet neighborhood on Vancouver Island became the seed of a shocking crime. Someone shot at a Punjabi music star's house and torched two vehicles. And as CTV's Brendan Strait reports, the apparent shooter captured the crimes on camera. Early hours Monday morning, multiple shots ring out on Ravenwood Road in Colwood. And it was coming from AP's house. AP Dylan, a rising star in the Punjabi music scene. Diane Reed lives nearby and ran to her kitchen window. And while I'm doing that, I see a vehicle leaving 
but I couldn't describe the vehicle because there was so much smoke. Smoke from two vehicles set ablaze in the home's driveway. This video taken by the apparent shooter circulated heavily on social media. CTV News has not been able to authenticate this video, although it shows the same house that stands here at 3346 Ravenwood Road today, riddled with 14 bullet holes and showing the obvious aftermath from the vehicle fires in the driveway. I mean, it's surprising to me that the, these type of events are happening in, in this area. Bikram Singh used to live in the area. He came by today to see for himself. It's disappointing to see and shocking as well. The homeowner, A.P. Dillon, was not home at the time of the shooting, although Reed says one man living in the home was. Fortunately, he got out of the house and he was okay. Dillon released this statement on social media saying, I'm safe. My people are safe. Thank you to everyone who reached out. Your support means everything. Peace and love to all. In a statement, RCMP say a preliminary investigation suggests that this was a targeted event and that there is no further risk to the general public. CTV News reached out to the RCMP today for an interview but was told they will not be taking questions. With many rumors circulating on social media that this was a crime that has ties to conflicts in India, thus leaving many in this neighborhood looking for answers to questions that are not being taken by the RCMP. You as the news media should be given more information so we all know what is going on. Why they are not telling us what exactly is happening. We live in the community. We have our right to know that what exactly is happening in our community. Brendan Strain, CTV News, Colwood. Turning to tonight's weather, the north coast should be home to partly cloudy conditions at a low at 10 degrees. The terrace Kinabat area will see partly cloudy conditions as well, but a low at 11 degrees instead. And the Bulkley Valley and Lakes District is set to get only a few clouds at a low at 1 degree. On the north coast, the upcoming week will see pretty much only rain and clouds, as well as a high shifting between 16 and 14 degrees. In the terrace Kinabat area, the week for them will also basically consist of only clouds and rain plus a high that bounces from 21 to 16 degrees. And in the Bulkley Valley and Lakes District, the next week or so will contain a couple of sunny days to start before it gets cloudy and rainy as well, while the high moves from 26 to 16 degrees. Checking out the highways now, visit Drive BC for the latest and up-to-date conditions, and as always, drive safe out there. On Highway 16, there is a special travel advisory, paving operations, utility work, construction work, crack sealing, and the Usk Ferry is out of service due to the low river level. Highway 37 has some maintenance, roadside brushing, and bridge maintenance. And there is some construction work and tree pruning on the Nishka Highway. And this is what the roads were looking like this afternoon around the region from the view of the province's highway cams. Still to come, a Fraser Valley farmer is attempting to disrupt the local agriculture economy. Welcome back. A Vancouver woman said she was attacked in Stanley Park by a man who tried biting her thumb off. She said the assault happened on the seawall with several witnesses, and she's hoping someone will recognize him. As CTV St. John Alexander reports, she said the man also threatened to stab her with a screwdriver. Just had complete rage in his in his eyes, like a like an animalistic rage. Carrie Shaw came face to face with that man late Sunday afternoon around here, Second Beach. She was with her husband and their 14-month-old daughter out for a ride when a large group on electric bikes came by. She says one of them was riding dangerously, weaving in and out of cyclists and pedestrians. He came so fast trying to cut me off that he almost ran into the baby bike trailer. So I was so scared that he was going to hit her and he was going so fast. She yelled at him and that's when the man began swearing at her. And when Shaw's husband came to her defense, things got violent. Right here is where he assaulted my husband, punched him in the head, 
broke his glasses, knocked his hat off his head. She began screaming for help because by now another person, likely the man's friend, was also punching her husband. I went to go pull the guy off of my husband by the arm and he reached back over and then chomped on my thumb. He looked me in the eyes and then he bit down and pulled back and wouldn't let go of my thumb. He was trying to bite my thumb off. There was a lot of blood and that might have spooked the friend who ran away, but not the man who Shaw says bit her. She says he then pulled out a screwdriver and threatened to stab them. As soon as he brought out that screwdriver, all I could think was that I was just scared for all of our lives. The photo you sent me. Right. Is that him? That's him. Vancouver police confirmed they were called and are trying to find a suspect as part of their investigation. How old do you think he was? He's probably in his 20s. Okay. I think all of them were probably around in their 20s. Now the family is understandably rattled but okay. They just want the man found and held accountable. Sinjin Alexander, CTV News, Vancouver. A Fraser Valley farmer is shaking things up, launching pop-up markets. He claims, save, he claims it saves people big money while helping farmers turn a profit. CTV's Kevin Shrek has more on a man aiming to disrupt the tr local agriculture economy. Look at how many people are coming out. Goggin Singh is starting a movement aiming to fix a food system he believes is broken. It's cheaper for me to get blueberries from the store that's shipped in from Mexico or California, but it's more expensive and difficult for me to get local produce. So it's kind of taking me on this journey. This squash, $2 yeah. a pound. In August, he launched a pop-up farmer's market hosted on his family's farm. Over 1,500 people came out. Also calling it a win for farmers. They sold out all their crops. They charged fair prices and they've ended up making two or three times more of the profit than they would in other venues. Guys, we've opened up the doors. He says his second pop-up, hosted at a different farm, had around 2,000 people come, all of them catching word via social media or his email subscriber list that he says is now more than 4,000 people. It's just one other viable option of how we can bring affordable produce conveniently to the public. But some farmers have taken issue with Singh's approach, at times taking aim at traditional farmers markets. They're not actually farmers there. They're just middlemen buying stuff from different suppliers and selling it, which is why it's so expensive. I think it's really great to be able to stand up and say, hey, we're offering this you know, community event where people can come together and access food. But I think it starts to become a little bit problematic in the message delivery when we miss some of the nuance on why food costs what it does to produce here in BC. I do apologize to any farmers who do feel hurt by my words, but that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that the whole system that we have is broken. The blueberry farmer admits he's anything but conventional, even getting into trouble at times for selling without a permit. But he says he won't be stopping anytime soon. If we do three or four more of these by the end of the year, I think that will really start shifting the momentum. For an industry that can use the help. According to Stats Canada, BC is the second least profitable province for farming in the country. Kevin Chirac, CTV News. And now we turn our attention to the stock markets. The Canadian dollar is up 11 tenths of a cent, the price of gold is up $3, oil is down $1.14, natural gas is down 5 cents, aluminum is down $16.50, and Toronto the TSX is down 1.69 points, the Venture Index is down 2.68, in New York the Dow Jones is up 38.04, and Nasdaq is down 52. Still ahead, students from a poor Coquitlam school are wondering when said school will be rebuilt. Welcome back. For some students in Port Coquitlam, this is anything but a normal school year. They're still wondering when they'll be able to return to their old school after it burnt down nearly last year. CTV's Craig Kraus has that story. The first day of school is in the books for thousands of students in BC. For Chloe, Tuesday marked the start of grade three, a new chapter in her already chaotic educational journey. Going on trail trips and being with my friends. She is among hundreds of former Hazel Trimbath Elementary students who are not returning to the same school as last September. After it burned to the ground in October, 
forcing families to pack up and send their kids to another poor Coquitlam school. We just bought our house here like five years ago, so we want to be able to walk our kids to school. So he's a little upset that they're not building it. We're just kind of still waiting in limbo if the school's going to be rebuilt or not. Frustration mounting as parents say they've been left in the dark. And we've gotten a few uh, bits of information, but not enough to really uh, put anybody's minds at ease. We do feel like our voices are unheard, for sure. Ignored. Ignored. Something the city's mayor, Brad West, says even the municipality can't get answers. We've heard nothing official, nothing formal. We haven't heard anything from the Ministry of Education. We haven't heard a timeline. Uh, we haven't heard really anything formally, uh, and that's a concern. So CTV News went to the source and asked BC's Minister of Education, Rachna Singh, directly. What's the timeline? Because many parents this morning are feeling frustrated that they've been left in the dark in this situation. Uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, for me, the focus is that the school student education is not, the students are not left without the, like a proper education. So I'm, one thing that I'm very happy about that those students, like who lost, uh, uh, the, uh, who, uh, who were part of Hazel Trembeth, they are getting the uh, quality education as they deserve. But as I said, the, all the details about the, uh, the, the rebuilding of the school, that there's a process that is going on, like a lot of internal talks uh, uh, are happening and uh, I would be more than happy to share those details with you very soon. Before or after the election? Uh, we are hoping to get it as soon as possible. More uncertainty, but in the meantime, kids are eager to kickstart another year. What are you looking forward to most this year? Going to Playland for the field trips. Yeah. Craig Crow, CTV News, Port Coquitlam. That's all of our news for now. From all of us at CFDK TV News, I'm Kale Maslin, and thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.